Hello, thank you all for attending this event. I'm Jennifer Keller, the Programming Coordinator at the Westport Library, and I'm with John Moe, the author of The Hilarious World of Depression, and Karen Krupnik, a therapist at Positive Directions, the Center for Prevention and Counseling in Westport. Before I give a fuller introduction to our speakers, I want to let you all know this event is presented in partnership with Positive Directions, Westport Together, and the Westport Department of Health and Human Services. We love our partners. Please also note that you can still order a book plate signed copy of The Hilarious World of Depression through the link below to, through tonight. Um, and into the wee hours of the morning in case you can't sleep. It's right down there at the bottom of your screen. It says purchase a book plated signed copy today. Um, once the books have come in from our bookstore, um, purchasers will be sent an email when the books are ready for pickup at the Westport Library. And remember, you can always type a question at any time during this talk through the ask a question tab at the bottom of your screen. We will be at taking audience questions towards the end of the conversation. So please definitely ask John your questions down there. So tonight, Karen Krupnik is a licensed professional counselor with many years of experience providing services in the nonprofit sector to clients of all ages. And John Moe, our our author tonight has served as host of national public radio broadcasts such as Weekend America, Marketplace, Tech Report, and Wits. His reporting has been heard on All Things Considered, Morning Edition, and Marketplace, some of my favorites. <laughs> I had to bring that in. His writing has also appeared in humor anthologies, The New York Times Magazine, McSweeney's, and The Seattle Times. So without further ado, since no one is here to see me, I am going to get off the screen and let you two discuss the book. Great, John Mo, it is such a pleasure to meet you. Um, I'm so glad to be here. Although now my mind is blown at the idea of a library selling books. Like I was just <laughs> the library in the internet and then I'm somehow in Connecticut. Exactly. Selling books and it's like, I just don't, you know, maybe they sell cotton candy or fish. <laughs> and, and, and actually it's even more of a miracle. You know, a tornado came through here and uh, most of the town has been, was out of power up until a couple of days ago. In uh -huh. fact, there, Yes, a tornado. It was a remnant of that uh, tropical storm hurricane that uh, came through. Okay. So um, we were very happy that power came back. Okay. Yeah. Glad to so, be here. yes, I'm glad you're here. Um, so, a client of mine introduced me to the Hilarious World of Depression podcast a couple years ago, and I've been a big fan ever since. I think I've listened to most of the four seasons. So, um, I really, really enjoy it. In fact, I've recommended it to friends and clients as well. Um, so I guess the place I want to start is kind of where you start your interviews. Um, is depression funny? Personally, I think it is. And <laughs> a question that, that has been answered a lot of different ways on uh, the podcast. And, and just for housekeeping purposes, um, the, I hear people saying, well, the, the podcast is no more. But I don't use that expression. I'm just saying it ended its run at 8 p.m. and then I wink a lot. <laughs> I'll have more to announce down the road. Um, but I think it's funny in the way that Groucho Marx is funny. Um, I I'm, I love Duck Soup. It's one of my favorite um, comedies. And so, like, your mind um, is Margaret Dumont in a Marx Brothers movie, and in Duck Soup. Margaret Dumont has planned this wonderful state dinner and it, everything is elegant and perfect and the food and the decorations and everybody's dressed up. It's going to be good for diplomacy. Mm -hmm. People have a lovely time. And then here comes Groucho and his idiot friends, just <laughs> ruining everything, um, insulting people, making everyone look ridiculous. And it's a complete disruption. And it's it's rude. It's an awful thing he's doing. It's, mm -hmm. But it's 
inescapably funny that exactly. everything would be disrupted. And so depression okay. is the Groucho Marx of, uh, or maybe depression is more like Harpo and anxiety. <laughs> It's that same disruptive force, you know, and like like in a lot of the book, I, I use a lot of analogies. So it's Groucho Marx. It's a toddler who's gotten behind the wheel of a moving tractor, dangerous, exactly. yet hilarious. Yeah, so yeah, 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 I do. I have a, a, a lot of uh, clients who refer to that, the kind of, you know, self-talk that goes off the rails as, you know, an out of control train with, you know, a a, a horse on top driving it. And um, it definitely is a, an appropriate analogy for sure. So for, for people that aren't as familiar with the podcast as I am, could you describe it a little bit and how it led to the book we're talking about tonight? Sure. Um, so I, I've done a lot of stuff in, in, in radio and in comedy. And um, I got to know a lot of comedians and musicians um, who had dealt with depression. And um, what struck me about them, besides the the kind of recurrence of it uh, and the, how common it was, was that it's hard to explain. Like, I've never really seen a, a definition of depression that I've been satisfied mm -hmm. with. Um, but, but uh, like, even, even William Siren's book, you know, or, or Andrew Goldman, like, wonderful authors. Yep. Can't quite phrase it. Right, right. <laughs> But what I do know is that a comedian or a musician can phrase things in such a way that they cut through the fog and connect to the heart. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's, it's that realization like, oh my God, that song, it's like that song is about me or, or the joke that's told that's like, oh no, somebody else thought that way? I thought yeah. I was the one who ever thought of that. And then when the laugh comes out, it's a sense of relief. Yes. And, um, because you're not alone. And so that was sort of the idea is to take this thing that's so hard to define and that makes people feel so isolated. Mm -hmm. And have conversations about these experiences with people who are good at, at phrasing them, good at connecting with the human experience. And and that's really where where it came from. And, and a lot of, you know, after a while I started noticing um, recurring themes, recurring things that happened to each person, we kind of started to notice the pathology from the illness. Mm -hmm. And and then when it came time to to write a book, um, my, my agent said, you should really write a book. This is really a good subject. And I said, well, a little bit of depression talking here. I said, well, who wants to hear about me? You know, I, I'm, I'm more interested in other people. And she said, well, I think it could help. I think it could help. Folks. And I'm like, okay, good. So I really set out to write about the experiences that I had that I had found a lot of other people had as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and and I like the way you set up the book. So you have, you know, kind of a couple chapters that are really memoir where you're describing your personal experience. And then you'll have a chapter that's kind of showing various people you've interviewed who have had those similar themes or similar experiences. So what I really like about it is the, the whole concept that it really normalizes it, that yes, depression is a thing. Lots of people have it and mm -hmm. we can talk about it and we can get help for it. Um, yeah. So and I, I think your book does a really good job at that. Um, and in fact, I, I, I kind of, um, Agree. I think I think it was in the book. Maybe it was in an article I read that uh, you sometimes say you've gone professional at depression. Yeah, there are very few people <laughs> who are so good at being depressed. <laughs> I'm one of them. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to portray it in sunlight, and so that means, I mean, I, my whole thing, my my whole like mission in life is dragging this thing out to have regular conversations mm -hmm. about it. what about a you know a bum knee or a shoulder injury mm -hmm. or anything else. and and so to have that honest conversation about it but also to not glamorize it or not make it look any easier to deal with than it right. is right you know, kind of know what you're up against and you know disabuse the reader of the notion of the you know, how you have to be a tortured artist in order to make any art, which is right. a lot of hooey. So I really wanted to just drag it out and shine bright lights. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and one of the things that I think you do, you know, just so well in the book is with the analogies, explaining kind of your experience and the experience of the people that that you've encountered. And there's this wonderful scene at the bridge scene at the very beginning of the book where you kind of explain, I mean, you use a lot of fun little terminology in the book. Mm -hmm. like it's not depression, it's D, clinical depression. Yeah. And you talk a lot about kind of normies, people who haven't dealt with depression and saddies. So this, um, that little piece, if you wouldn't mind reading it, I think is sure. uh, gives, yeah. gives a nice little clip. <laughs> I, mean, the, I don't know when we came up with Clint D. It just struck me as funny. And then with normies and saddies, um, so that's people who have not dealt with depression, people who have, recognizing that there's a lot more to depression than that. <laughs> Sure. Uh, but it was my producer and I, and we would talk about who to book on the show. And, you know, I would say, well, how about, uh, well, he's a Connecticut guy, John Hodgman. Mm -hmm. You know, my producer would say that. And I'm like, no, John's a friend of mine. He's a normie, it turns out. <laughs> you know, who's a saddie? Paul F. Tompkins. Let's get by. <laughs> I mean, well, that's the thing, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so this is from the first chapter of the book. And this is... Uh, this is, it opened with me um, after really a, a lifetime of, well, first not knowing that I had this thing and then thinking, well, the best I could ever hope for is to um, not get any worse. Mm -hmm. I had this idea that as long as I, you know, I, I stopped getting worse once I sort of figured out what was going on, got on a good schedule of meds. Um, and I thought, okay, if I could just not get worse, until I die, I'll win. Um, <laughs> win at depression. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, this is from when I finally started um, started thinking maybe I could get better. Um, I'm going to start a little bit before when I normally start. My unique brand of depression responds to stress. Specifically, it blows up under stress. When the going gets tough, I don't get amped up. I get despondent. I turned into a human version of a song by the Smiths. By the time I reached for the phone to call Julie for an appointment, I was basically Morrissey crooning alone in a darkened basement. Stressors included my soon-to-be high school senior son, Charlie, getting ready to apply to colleges, booking the next season of our show, and trying to do a good job writing the book you're reading right now. And yes, there's always stress in life. We all go through stuff, but the rate at which I metabolized stress into depression had gone through the roof. It was a brutally efficient machine. What do you have to be stressed about? The normies might have said, if I ever talked about these things with the normal people. You know, a family, a house, a car, a good job, just deal with it. As if I could simply do that. As if I chose this, as if I looked at the options available to me and they were clearly labeled perseverance and freaking the fuck out all the time. <laughs> and I calmly said, hmm, yes, I select option B. <laughs> Normies and fatties are different, you see. Let's say there's a long bridge going over a high canyon and there are two cars on it, one for the normies, one for the saddies. The normies are... <clears throat> are in a big, excuse me, water here. Glamorous world of radio, everybody. And the <laughs> Normies are in a big land yacht of a Buick. It weighs a ton, low to the ground. When a stiff wind blows, the Normies feel a mild push, but continue driving, perhaps casually noting that it's getting windy out there. Then they go back to listening to, I don't know, Foo Fighters. The saddies are piled into a Model T with a sail on top of it for some reason. They see the wind coming, and it's all they can do to keep from being blown off the road and plunging into the canyon. The normies see the saddies struggle and wonder what the problem is, because to them, the wind doesn't seem that bad. Try being more positive, the normies <laughs> shout. The saddies Model T goes tumbling off the side, and the saddies deploy the parachutes, they've gotten used to wearing. <laughs> I've had good therapists in the past, briefly, but all I ever took away from therapy was a somewhat clearer understanding of how messed up I was. That's helpful, sure, but it's not really progress, like knowing the brand of a refrigerator you're locked in. And this was not the fault of the therapists I had seen who were all trained pros and good at their jobs. It was my fault, or Clint D's fault. I never wanted to go all that deep in therapy, 
because that's where the monsters were. I'm talking about the really, really bad memories, the deep bruises, the scars, the events that significantly shape a person through injury, trauma. Rather than tackle the past, I was willing to settle for a tense ceasefire with it, letting my life be like Middle East countries that hate each other. There would be car bombings, but a homeland is a homeland. I'd gone through life with the belief, often heard in simple-minded quarters of popular psychology, that the past is the past and you just have to move on. <laughs> Let it go, the simple-minded say. Again, as if no one had ever tried that before. Don Henley and Glenn Fry wrote a, long, a song along these lines called Get Over It. My response song would be called Fuck off, Don Henley and Glenn Fry. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I suspect most people who choose the willfully simplistic Henley method as people uh, are people who've never had much unpleasant stuff in their past to begin with, because this notion is some bullshit. If you can't understand your past, then you don't really know how your mind got to where it is now, because you simply don't know yourself. Making matters worse, depression causes the sadie to lose hope. It inserts despair where hope should go, and you're left at least suspecting, if not believing in your heart, that nothing will or even could get better. So to figure things out? I mean, depression doesn't even want you to get up, take a shower, and brush your teeth. So something like figuring out how your own mind works feels about as easy as taking a bus to Mars. <laughs> there are a lot in the book also I should, I should. yeah no and, and 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 what i like so much about that that passage is you 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 both give um kind of the context of depression that it has a bunch of sources from where it comes um it definitely has some it has some aspects of perhaps predisposition it has some aspects of childhood and adulthood experiences. And what the example really shows is um, not only do the normies and saddies have sort of different vehicles that they're traveling in, they have a totally different experience of what comes at them, um, you know, which I think is, is just spot on. Um, you, you mention um, in your story that you've had kind of a long journey to feeling better. Um, I think that Julie is therapist number 12. I'm sorry about the prior 11, but. Um, uh, I just wasn't, I wasn't looking at it as the collaboration that it was. I, I had always looked at it as something that was going to be done to me. Right. And not yeah. something that I was, that I had to work on just as hard, if not harder than the person helping. Me. Right. Right. Can you can you talk a little bit about um, I, I think you said that you, you didn't really even know that you were depressed. You didn't have those words to put on it until I think I did the math. You were in your late 30s, maybe. <laughs> I think, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I noticed well, I noticed weird things starting around seven or eight, but um, it didn't really hit me until I was in junior high. And um, that's when and I was never. You know, I was never a, like I say, a moper. You know, I've, I've never been, I can always get out of bed. Mm -hmm. um, it's always taken more of a, a sense of uh, uh, agitation and distraction mm -hmm. um, and insomnia um, than, than just despair. Uh, so, you know, it hit me in junior high, but at the time I thought, well, this must be this puberty thing I kept hearing yeah, about. Yeah, sure. Um, and it and it was. I mean, there's chemicals, there's hormones, there's all sorts of things going on. Um, but especially when I first started the show, everybody I talked to said, "Yep, junior high, seventh, yeah. eighth, seventh, eighth grade. That's that's when it really started." And that was the case for me. And you know, when I saw everybody else just sort of going on with their lives, I thought, "Well, I better do that too." Mm -hmm. And um, I was really interested in theater, and it was pretty good actor. And so I just started acting all the time. <laughs> um, you, so, you acted like a normie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know, there and I had I had a lot of um a big stretches of time where I didn't really worry about it all that much. There's nothing about um about college in the book because that went really well. Mm -hmm. Um but then it's a stress reactive depression. So by my mid thirties, I was married. We owned a house. We had two mm -hmm. kids, and I had a job that I took seriously. And I just started to buckle. And my wife said, "You know, 
this sounds like depression. I've been reading up on it. You should mm -hmm. go. To and I said, well, no, it's, it's, it's fine. Uh, don't, I don't need to worry about it. Um, because this, this makes sense if you've dealt with depression and it won't make sense if you haven't. I didn't want to waste the doctor's time. Oh, yes. I thought, well, they've got more important. <laughs> right. And, and then also, um, our, our uh, health insurance at the time, the copay was 10 bucks. Oh I'm yeah, like, that's a lot. Dollars <laughs> on this thing. That's such a barrier. I know, and so I, you know, I write about this in the book and um, I went in and, and saw a therapist and he very quickly said, yeah, you're depressed. I'm like, oh wait, this is, but this has been going on since I was 12. And he's like, mm -hmm. okay, you've been depressed since you were 12. He said, you're pretty boring. This is a really easy diagnosis. <laughs> um, but he, but he also said, you know, there's, I, I can't say take this pill and it will go away. Mm -hmm. um, everybody responds differently, but we can, he said, I'm going to get you on some meds to at least get you out of the ditch you're in right now right. so you can function. Um, and then let's look at diet, exercise, therapy, meditation, mm -hmm. we find some stuff that works. And, you know, I had thought being diagnosed with a chronic mental illness and finding out that I'd had it for decades would be crushing, but it was the most liberating feeling uh, I'd ever <laughs> I'd ever experienced. Right. Like, <clears throat> It's not a character flaw or weakness. Right. It's right. a thing. And so. and and so I'm assuming you immediately went home and started taking your medication <laughs> and, and took it consistently forever and everything well, was fine. Yeah, you've read the book. Uh, <laughs> it uh, no, I mean I thought the knowing the problem and solving the problem were the same thing. Right. Um, right. And I thought like the first, I think I had Zoloft first and it really messed with like my gastrointestinal system like, mm -hmm. and I would get sick and I, and I thought, okay, well, I guess meds don't work. Mm -hmm. and I judged all, all meds, you know, yeah. be like having one type of sandwich, like, mm, I don't like this. I hate all sandwiches. Right. And, it, and it's like, well, I guess I have the kind of depression that pills don't, aren't going to work on. So, right. you know, right. I should get up. <laughs> When, and, you know, and I think I was, I was scared too. We had addiction in my family. I was scared of a, a substance that would, that would change things. A few years ago, somebody on Twitter said, well, I don't want to take a pill that's just going to make me happy all the time. And like, well, first of all, it doesn't work like that. And secondly, why not? Exactly. <laughs> and, exactly. Uh, you know, but it took me a while to kind of find the right path to, to get on meds that just made me feel like I used to be able to feel or like how other people feel mm -hmm. without. And mm -hmm. so it's getting me to a place where I can be sad and I can cry, but I can also laugh and be pensive. I don't know if pensive is an emotion, but I can be everything else, you know? Right. Right. Uh, you know. Yeah. I think it was, um, I don't remember who it was. Somebody you interviewed was talking about uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and kind of described it as, you know, you kind of have all these roadways, broken down roadways going the wrong way in your brain and cognitive behavioral therapy can help put down, you know, nice pristine highways with lots of clear signs that get to you to where you want to go. I think that was one of mine. Um, oh, that was you, okay. Yeah, but, I liked it, it was good. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, like the more I talk to people, the ones who had had success in therapy kept coming back to cognitive behavioral therapy, mm -hmm. which is a way of spotting the distortions, you know, mm -hmm. catastrophizing, all or nothing thinking of just like, you know, looking for weird omens. And these were all things that I had, I had done. And it's about retraining the thinking paths to get to a more logical, manageable uh, place. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and it also, my therapy has been about like finding out, oh, okay, so an adult child of an alcoholic often will respond in this situation mm -hmm. um, because of safety issues. I'm like, right. oh, that explains a lot. And it's yeah. not a matter of blaming my dad for drinking. He had an illness. But right. it's exactly. a matter of thinking, oh, that's why I work this way. Right, right. What can you do about it and get better? Right. right. And, and, it, and it can help, help shift the thinking from that idea that, this is a character flaw. I just have to kind of suck it up to 
you know, this is something that makes sense given what my experience in life has been. And it's something that other people deal with. And it's something that, you know, we can, we can get help for. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to, I want to, I'm going to shift a little dark if it's okay with you. Sure. Um, you talk in the book about your brother, Rick, who died by suicide um, and the, how it affected you, how it affected your family, uh, the different ways people in your family kind of responded to it. Um, and there was a part of you that actually felt responsible for it um, in a big way, um, which obviously outside your head, in my head, made no sense at all. But um, in your head, it really stuck there for a very long time. Can, yeah. can you talk a little bit about about uh, that time in your life? Yeah. So, I mean, the short version is that the first book in the first book I wrote back in 2006 came out in October of 2006. I wrote uh, about gun ranges and I went to a gun range in Seattle and I had to bring my friend Larry with me because uh, I wasn't a member of that gun range. Mm -hmm. And I said, so I need to bring a friend and they said yeah you need to bring a friend because there's an issue people show up at gun ranges to kill themselves because they thought they think um it'll be less trouble for everybody else mm -hmm. uh, same reason people i found out kill themselves at funeral homes and um and so i wrote about this as just sort of this uh kind of odd loophole of a law because I, I found it kind of funny mm -hmm. uh, and my brother, who had dealt with a lot of addiction over the years um, and mental health problems that he had, hadn't told people about, um, read the book and a couple of months later um, signed up for a membership at a gun range. And in April of 2007, he killed himself with a, a gun at a gun range. And as soon as I made that connection, um, he was so proud of me. Like he really, he really uh, celebrated everything that I did. Um, and as soon as I made that connection, I'm like, I'm responsible. I'm responsible for his death. Yeah. And, um, and it wasn't like, a, oh, you know, feel sorry for me. I was like, oh, no, no, this is exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. And um, it really, it, it messed me up, obviously. Mm -hmm. I went to a, a counselor. Um, in Seattle, soon after it happened, uh, who said, well, you know, what makes, I, I said, isn't it awfully convenient, that's what I told the, the therapist, isn't it awfully convenient that I wrote about this thing and that he died that way? Isn't it awfully convenient to say I'm not responsible? Mm -hmm. And he said, isn't it awfully convenient to say you are responsible? And I said, ah, touche. Um, he said, you know, to a certain extent, he was kind of a, a tough counselor. He's like, you need to get over yourself. He yeah. said, how did you and your brother talk? I'm like, well, we barely talked. Mm -hmm. Okay. How important, you know, were you in his day-to-day -day life? Not at all. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not, everybody's Luke Skywalker in their own story. Right. But, you know, you're like stormtrooper number six. <laughs> you know, you're not, you're not that big. And so that helped for a while. But um, the trauma of, of that guilt um, and mm -hmm. the trauma of seeing Rick, I saw him, uh, I flew down to San Diego after it happened and I, he was already brain dead, but I did see him, um, mm -hmm. before, before he finally died. Um, and he was bloated from the transfusion and it was grotesque and the, the trauma of that guilt and seeing that messed me up mm -hmm. until I finally got MDR therapy, which, yeah. uh, sort of solved it um yeah and, yeah no, no because you, you you kind of um i mean you kind of demonstrate one feature of the mind of someone who tends to have depression we yeah. kind of glom on to, to stuff particularly bad stuff or sad stuff and 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 guilt and have a really hard time dislodging it um, well, and reinforcing the the idea that the that the depression gives you of what whatever scenario involves you being the worst is probably the thing that happened. Exactly. So it's not just that your brother died. Um, it's that you killed him, and yeah. I had certainty that I yeah. killed him. And it took a lot of therapy to arrive at 
the knowledge that he did that to himself. Right. Uh, you know, whatever else happened, he made that decision. Whatever state of mind he was in, he um, he made that decision. I still have um, a belief that I am responsible for his death, and that the the chronic illness that I have whispers mm -hmm. that to me yeah. very regularly and right. always will. Right. But with what we were talking about with those those thinking patterns and those pathways. Mm -hmm. Um, what the EMDR therapy, eye movement desensitization retraining, has taught me is to link that thought with the phrase, he did this to himself. Right, right, right. So have you have yeah. you found that you're more able to shift to that yeah. when it comes up? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean it's it's uh that's what that that's what that therapy is all about, an, an instant neural response. Like as soon as, you know, it's, it's, uh, as soon as that thought's in there, it's like white blood cells come in right. And, uh, right. and fight against it. I mean, it's, it's never, I mean, there, there's, I write in the book about how we're a narrative driven society and we're, mm -hmm. we're, we're hooked on the stories that we get told exactly. and whether that that's Dr. Seuss and Peter Rabbit or Game of Thrones, it's the mm -hmm. same idea. And we're looking for this formula uh, where everything is wrapped up at the end, you know, and the depression goes away. It never goes away. It's always going to be there. Right. And I just have to learn how to manage it. Like, mm -hmm. you know, this is on my mind right now because my, my son is getting ready to go back to his second year of college. Um, it's just like the worst college roommate. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, and and you you mentioned a couple times that um, your depression often gets kicked up by stress. How how have you been dealing with the stress the entire world's in at the moment? Yeah, plus I got laid off from my job. Um, it's, a, it's it's a hard question to answer. Yeah, um, because there there are it's a real challenge. It, it mm -hmm. really it really sucks really bad. Um, it is, it's, it's interesting to note, you know, when I talk with, especially my daughters, my daughters are, are 17 and 12. Um, and when they're just at breaking points, as they often get to, I'm like, you know, believe it or not, this is a healthy response. <laughs> Cause yeah. This is, yeah. we're all going through trauma every day. And right. so don't go expecting that you're just going to surf the wave. You're going to get pulled under. Right, right, right. Um, and I've heard from a lot of friends who are are saddies who say, you know, this is what we've been training for. <laughs> you know, this, this like uh, invisible thing that is right. killing people, and we don't know if it'll kill us, and we don't know mm -hmm. what's happening to the economy, and there's nobody in charge. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's a classic. Uh, you know, substance abusing or absentee parent situation. Mm -hmm. really. mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so, but, but for a lot of us, like we've been thinking that in the most stable of times and, mm -hmm. and we've hopefully learned some coping mechanisms. And right. we've, we've learned how to retrain, retrain those thought patterns. And we've learned mm -hmm. to say, oh, okay, I know what's happening when I start doing this. Uh -huh. um, one of my favorite uh, guests that I've ever had on the show was just a, a, a listener. She's been on a couple times, named Bree, and uh, she talked about how she she named her. She has an anxiety disorder as well. She named her anxiety Steve, <laughs> and so whenever she's like at the Mall of America and and thinks maybe I should jump off the fourth floor of this, she says, "Oh, Steve." Like Steve is always coming around with the worst ideas. He's always there, right? But right. Just an idiot. And so, like, she'll talk to Steve, and like, she'll be out with her friends, and she'll be mumbling to herself, and the friends will say, "Steve, huh? Yeah, I just kind of check in with Steve." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, like, I, I, yeah. It, it it does help to. I mean, what I love about that example is one, it externalizes the anxiety, which is something we try to help people do, and yeah. two, it, it kind of makes it something that's easier to talk about. And I'm really impressed that your your um, friend is comfortable 
sharing that with her friends because then they can, you know, understand what she's going through, which I think, uh, you know, makes, yeah. makes just a huge difference. Well, really, the the listeners of the show and, and the readers of the book, I've found it's like, um, you know, I, I get I get a lot of mail. <laughs> I get a lot. Of <laughs> I can imagine. And and a lot of people are, you know, it's like it's this growing army of people who've decided let's let's be open about this. Let's let's talk about this. I mean, the the I'll tell you the challenging mail that I get, the difficult mail for me to get, is. Um, when people, one, when people say, I don't know if I want to live anymore. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not a trained therapist. I'm not a crisis counselor. Um, and the, the other one that's hard to get, odd, oddly enough, is when people say, uh, your show saved my life. Your book yeah. saved my life. Um, I was in a bad place. And if it weren't for the work you were doing, mm -hmm. be here. And that really knocked me off my feet in a not very good way for a long time. Cause I thought, well, what if I had taken the week off? <laughs> you know, what if I, what if I hadn't done that? And, um, I talked to my friend, John Darneal about it. And mm -hmm. John, uh, records music and plays concerts under the name, the mountain goats, um, beautiful singer, songwriter, former psychiatric nurse, oh, wow. uh, survivor of an abusive childhood. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, do you ever get these on? He's like, I get them all the time. And he right. said, what I, what I tell these people is that I'm an artisan or a craftsman. I make things. In his case, I make songs. In my case, I make books and podcasts. Mm -hmm. He's like, if I've made a tool that you have used to help yourself have a better life, mm -hmm. that's wonderful. But all I did was make the tool. Right. You, right. you use this tool. I made it available to you. You picked it up. Mm -hmm and used it and you get all the credit for that because the depression diminishes that to it's like, Oh, I crawled out of wanting to die. Um, it must be somebody else's credit to that. Right. It's, right. You know, the right. depression wants to steal the credit from you. Right. Right. Because there's this, this factor in a, a lot of people's depression um, of positives really don't matter. Yeah. They, they, they don't really, you know, however many compliments you get, they either are stupid if they think that, or they don't matter. Um, yeah. And anything negative is is totally huge. I think um, really reviews, and then you fixate on the the one person who hated. It. Of course, solve that problem by not reading any reviews. Yes, yes, yes. On any of them. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Um, you know, I w one thing that that uh, really surprised me was your time at Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> It, you know, it, it sounds like just such a difficult, I mean, it sounds like you did an amazing job there and it sounds like, no, and it sounds like you had such a difficult time while you were there and the way you write about it in the book was just hilarious with the various characters coming in and out and there, uh, it, it was just very, very funny. That was the sample chapter that I wrote to to pitch the book originally. Really? Oh, that's so funny. Yeah. I thought it was encapsulated everything. Um, you know, it, and it's really where the stress was on because it was, you know, late nineties and nobody knew what they were doing. We would have meetings all day trying to figure out what we should be doing and then nobody would get any work done. And, you know, impossible deadlines, you're inventing an industry and you know everyone's a snake it's it was a horrible place and it was chaos and so there's no you know it's it's hard i i was so thrown i had to go work in public radio for 20 years. <laughs> how long um, were you actually at amazon what's that how long were you actually at amazon oh, only just two three years yeah. um but uh but yeah the, that's when i first learned about how stress reactive uh i was but it was kind of a you know, it was a fun place in some ways because you could just make up the rules as you went along. Mm -hmm. Jeff Bezos put a hula skirt on me at a party one time. <laughs> you know, because we were work friends a little. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and and of course now it's it's uh, just sucking the world dry, and I think he yeah. should. Be able to move himself. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I think um, one one interesting kind of ex factor that I think you identified as part of your depression. That a lot of people don't recognize is anger. Um, yeah. 
anger is, you know, sometimes depression, just wearing a different costume. And I think some of the, um, I mean, I was laughing out loud. I had to read it to my family. Uh, the uh, dump incident, I won't make you read it now, but um, uh, just you, you, you did such a great job of showing that inner monologue of how you went from, you know, sort of just waiting in line to suddenly escalating and road yeah. rage and craziness happening. There's a fair amount of road rage in the book. I, I'll say that I've been I've been saved from physical confrontation and certain bodily harm <laughs> by my physical cowardice. So you know <laughs> cowardice. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I think I think anger is a, a really common part of depression that people forget about and it's really understandable because mm -hmm. there's so much pain, it's almost exactly. a logical response. You want to send the pain out of your body. And right. so you want to transfer it to someone else, right. you know, or at least have the the fellowship of somebody else being in pain and fear like you are. Right. And, uh, that took me a long time to get, yeah. to get around. And, and sometimes anger is a more acceptable emotion than deep despair and sadness. Well, um, and, and anger, and this is another part of cognitive behavioral therapy, Anger by itself, there's nothing wrong with it. You know, right. there's a lot of things that happen that if you're angry about it, hell yeah. You know, that yes. makes you, like uh, swerving into other cars, that's the behavioral end of the cognitive behavior. Yeah. Like the actions, and a lot of people, you know, I talk to people about this all the time, like just because you're furiously angry doesn't mean you have to start punching people. <laughs> exactly. Decide what the behavior is. Right. Right, right, right. So I think um, Jennifer wanted us to stop at this point and see if there were any questions that anybody had or that she wanted to ask. So Jennifer, I'm kind of throwing it back to you. Um, <laughs> I'm just gonna come back as the voice from beyond. Okay, oh. okay, okay. Yes. Um, well, you two are balanced so nicely on the screen right now. Um, we do actually have a question from the audience right now, and I'm just going to read it um, straight as it's been written. So you guys can handle that later. Um, this writer says, I know I should ask someone licensed for medical for mental health care, and I plan to. But checking your company's web, job website constantly because you're sure your job is listed is probably a sign of imposter syndrome. Is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you're, it sounds like you're concerned that your job performance is not adequate. Um, and I would, you know, I would sort of ask you, um, you know, have, have, what's the evidence that that's the case? Um, or have, is this what John and I were talking about before, where we don't believe the positive and look constantly for the negative? So, um, I mean, I think imposter syndrome is something a lot of people have. Uh, John talks about it a lot in his book, and um, I think he experienced it himself and maybe can talk about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, a certain amount of imposter syndrome is is understandable. I mean, every I became interested in that idea when I worked at Amazon. I'm like, what am I doing here? There's, there's going to be somebody's going to catch me. Um, and I've always been interested in the idea. And every very successful person I know has felt it to some degree mm -hmm. one or another. Um, you know, I think they're, the people who never feel it are the ones you got to watch out for. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that for people who have never experienced like a real disorder level of depression, like a, a you know, a can't function in life the same mm -hmm. way uh, kind of level, it's a much more grim and serious condition because mm -hmm. you lack the inner core of self-belief um, that would ordinarily make you able to dismiss the imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a, a healthy normie mind can say, I feel like an imposter. No, but I know I've done these jobs before. I know they believe in me and I've know I've done this. And they can get back to you know, get back to one. Um, I, I think in a case of like checking to see if uh, if your job has been listed 
Um, I mean, there's obviously like, go talk to your manager or whatever it is. <laughs> um, but also, you know, I think it's good to remember that sometimes it's the place you are that's crazy and not you. Right. Um, you know, if, if you're working in a place that is uh, secretive or that uh, is, you know, retributive, uh, you know, or if there's, if there's a toxic culture in terms of race or gender or orientation, mm -hmm. you know, check that because you might, you might be doing fine, but you're just in a messed up place. Right. Right. For sure. So, Oh, I think there might be another question, Jennifer. Yeah. There's an ask a question button down there. So if you want to click that and type something in, that's how you ask a question. Yep. So, um, we have another, we do actually have another audience question. Um, this person would like to know, John, do you have any plans for another podcast, another book? Where can we see you after this? Um, yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I, I have to be a little careful about what I say because, um, you know, the, the, there's a lot of conversations happening behind the scenes. I did tweet today that I've been having conversations all summer, and if you like the work I've been doing, um, there's some pleasant news coming in the future. Um, I am, I'm kicking around ideas for another book. Uh, uh, the one that I really want to write right now is, um, is just about the lies, about the, the distortions. Mm -hmm. um, because it, it has surprised me since the book came out how many people really responded to what's a relatively short section of the book, mm -hmm. about the distortions, because uh, they just had never thought of that before. I've thought about writing about you know the lies and examples of how those lies are formed. I've thought about writing, um, you know, we, we talked about uh, externalizing it. I've thought about writing a memoir, another memoir, but from the point of view of depression, like ah. as, as a person writing their story and, and the things that they've decided to do. Yeah, um, so, Steve's brother. Yeah, right. <laughs> My uh, my wife and I, um, at the invitation of my agent, are are coming up with some sketches for a children's book about depression. Oh, cool! Um, which I think could be really helpful. Um, but in terms of uh, in terms of the podcast, um, you know, I, I stay tuned. We'll just say stay tuned. And and your website is the same name. The the podcast website is the same, right? Well, it's hilariousworld.org is the is the APM iteration of the show right now. Um, all the archives are there. They're all free. Um, I'm at johnmo.website because I thought that was a funny name for a website. <laughs> it's a very funny website. Um, but if you want to stay stay up on, you know, if, if I'm announcing anything about podcasts in, in the future. Uh, wink, wink, take a look. Wink, wink, uh, at John Mo on Twitter is probably the easiest okay. way. So, 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 John, I know. Oh, I see some more questions. Um, yes. Okay. So, here we go. Um, John, do you have any tips for parents of teens with depression? Or Karen? Actually, either one of you could answer that one. I'll leave it to you, John. <laughs> I mean, well, I'll lead off, and then the person who knows what they're talking about can come in. Um, oh no! See, that's depression talking. I shouldn't say that. Uh, I've done research. <laughs> Um, yes. You know, with with my kids, um, what what we've tried to do and is um, from a very early age talk about how you know I deal with depression and I have this thing and I'm managing it and here's how I manage it. Um, in the same way that I might say I'm a Seattle Mariners fan, which is the baseball <laughs> equivalent of depression. And, uh, <laughs> And, you know, they, my kids will say, well, what happens if this, you know, happens to me? Because it runs in our family. I said, well, what happens to you? Then we go to a doctor and here's what we do. And here are the things that we look at. And so it's not, it's, you know, it, it's the same way we talk to them about sex, actually. Right. But from a very early age, we're like, you know, we're not going to make this a taboo thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not going to dwell on it. But here are the facts. Um, and, you know, take away a little bit of the mysticism about it. Um, but, you know, I, I think, and we talked, we did a show about this actually, because 
you know, you always think, well, teens are always morbid and they're pessimistic and they all go through that phase. How do you know when it's not a phase? Mm -hmm. um, and I will say it's the same thing as, as it happening in an adult. It, the, the definition of a disorder is if you aren't able to function like you otherwise would. If, you know, if you're not getting, if it's a kid, are you not going to school? Are you not ever doing homework? Are you losing touch with your friends? Mm -hmm. That's a disorder you need to go get that looked at. Yeah, and, and just to underscore a couple of things you said, John, I, I love the, the first part of it of making it okay to talk about it mm -hmm. um, because I think um, you experience this and I've a lot of people have. Um, you think there's something wrong with you, but you don't know what it is. You're afraid to tell your parents because they might think you're crazy or maybe they won't like you or maybe they'll be afraid. Um, there's just so many reasons um, that kids don't really tell their parents. And sometimes parents don't take it seriously. Um, and I think it's it's step one is make it okay to talk about and talk about it. And I think John's rule of thumb is, you know, how is it interfering with the day-to-day -day life? Um, and if you have any questions, you know, pediatrician is a great place to start. They are, you know, yeah. equipped to um, point you in the right direction. Well, that's a really good tip too, because it, you know, people say, well, I, I feel like I've got a depression thing going on. I'll call a psychiatrist. Well, it's a nine month waiting list. Yeah, exactly. a psychiatrist, you know, but I'm crazy now. <laughs> um, and that's when you go to a GP. That's when you go to a family doctor. Um, right. And you know, like get get some help. Don't feel like you need to wait that ridiculous right. time. For a second. Right, and, and and I think um, pediatricians and general practitioners are much better nowadays at being able to uh, you know understand this might be going on. Yeah, um, at least getting through your you know sure. getting the level of functionality. Exactly, exactly. Right. So, so we have another question that sort of relates to that. John, if you had a chance to speak to your younger self today, what advice would you have given your oh. junior high fatty self? I love and that. How did your experience growing up shape your parenting style? Um, wow. Um, I'll take the second one first. Um, I grew up with, um, I mean, for full context, I grew up with traumatized parents. My mm -hmm. parents uh, grew up in... My dad was born in 1931. My mom was born in 1934, um, and they were born in Norway. And when in 1940, the Germans came in, the Nazis took over their country, and they were under mortal threat for five years. Um, there's a lot about that in the book. Um, so the other book I want to write is the full history of that. Yeah. Uh, and my dad didn't um, have therapists available in war-torn or post-war Norway. Um, so he did what he was taught to do to handle things, which is to drink. And um, he he was a person with alcoholism. Um, and uh, he was absent a lot mentally. He was always home, mm -hmm. but he just knew not to talk to him after a certain time because he got real dumb. Right. Um, and so I actually, and I've had to work on this. I've been very present for my kids. Mm -hmm. I've talk, talked to them a lot. Um, they've always had very good vocabularies from all the talking. <laughs> um, and I've had to then make readjustments to say, uh, oh, you know, they don't need me all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they can be on their own. Just because my dad wasn't there enough doesn't mean I need to be there constantly. I can give myself a break and exactly. teach them independence at the same time. So that's been an interesting road. Um, what I would tell myself is you're not alone in thinking this. Mm -hmm. You're not the only one going through this. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that for a fact, because since the book came out, I've been hearing from people from my junior high. <laughs> wow, really? Yeah, who say, I always thought you had it all together. You were class president, which I was. You were class president. You were so funny. You were, you know, you did theater. You you really seemed to be the coolest guy. And I'm like, but you were a cheerleader. And <laughs> they'd be like, yeah. And I knew I was going to be exposed as a fraud. So, like, all these things were universal. And and I do take a lot of hope from seeing how my kids are growing up mm -hmm. and talking openly about these things mm -hmm. with their friends and talking about 
the uniquenesses of their mind. Like when my when my son at age 16 was diagnosed as being on the autism spectrum, he texted one of his friends and said, guess who has two thumbs and is on the spectrum? <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, wow. So I'm really encouraged by the openness that I see. Yeah, them. for sure. For sure. Um, I see yeah, we're running out of. Oh, OK. Go ahead. Don't mind. Um, OK, so first, I'm going to start with th this is the two part question, but I'm going to start with the second part first. So the first part. This, yes. So, uh, our watcher Lindsay would like to know if that is a free range chickens t shirt you are wearing. <laughs> it, it, okay, Lindsay, you get the prize today. Wow, who's that? They definitely get a free book. Um, okay, so her real question is that she likes how you added a list of albums you listened to while writing the book. Yes. She's never seen that in another book before. And what role does music play in your writing process? And what made you want to include that list with the book? Um, Wes Anderson, uh, the filmmaker, always the the soundtracks on his movies are often are, are generally the music he was listening to when he was making that movie. Mm -hmm. And um, I always thought that was kind of neat. And I think that it informs the writing that that I do. Um, because it's all part of the same experience. To me, it's, it's listening to music and, and, and writing. Um, I know a lot of people can't listen to anything when they write or they can't listen to anything with lyrics. Mm -hmm. I listen to things that are very familiar to me. Mm -hmm. I can't listen to an album I've never heard before, but I can listen to Quadrophenia. And I can listen to uh, you know, the Anodyne by Uncle Tupelo. Um, and it it's a, a way of kind of signaling to my brain that it's time to start writing. Mm -hmm. um, I included Quadrophenia by the Who on there because, um, uh, excuse me, um, it was one of my brother's favorite albums. Oh, wow, wow. Uh, we listened to the Who a lot together. Yeah. And one Who album that I never understood I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, there's a whole storyline here. I gotta understand it. I don't understand it. I'm just gonna move on and listen to Tommy. It's a lot easier. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so I had never listened to Quadrophenia much. And so when I, in the first part of writing about the book and in, in later chapters about Rick, um, it made me feel closer to him and made me more able to write. Wow. Well, wow. thank you for telling us that story. Yeah, I don't think I've told that one before. That's special. Yeah. Wow. Jen, I see your face. I, I I'm back. Um, well, I just, we seem to have gone through the audience question, and I wanted to thank you, John and Karen, for bringing this to Westport and beyond. Um, we have I saw we have people from all the way from California watching today, so certainly. <laughs> a wide variety of people here. Um, so I would also like to thank our sponsor partners, um, Positive Directions, Westport Together, and the Westport Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and thank you all for attending and watching this very heartfelt event tonight. Just remember, you can share this link with friends and family if you feel that someone else needs to watch this. Um, you use the same link that you're watching this on today and you'll be able to watch it actually moments after we finish up here. And remember, you can still purchase a copy of the hilarious impression below um, and pick it up at the library when you receive the email or you can borrow a copy from the Westport Library. Or Is there a library. Yes. Is there a yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, and so thank you, John and Karen, so much. Um, for more author talks, virtual events, and updates about the library, please visit westportlibrary.org. Thank you all for coming so very much. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Buy the book through nice the library. Yes. Yeah. Now. 